YouTube. Welcome to another installment of the Evian blog. Today I thought I'd show you guys out there, for those of you that haven't seen it before, the insides of a hard drive. What I'm going to do is, I have a one terabyte hard drive out of my Seagate Black Armor NAS which has failed. Um, so I thought, well what an opportunity to show those that don't know what a hard drive is or what it works. And also I'd like to diagnose to see what actually went wrong with the drive, if possible. Um, granted, the drive isn't a, t a 2011 model. Um, it's a set. To, it's in a RAID 5 array of four hard drives, four one terabyte drives. It's the only one that's failed. The other two were replaced uh, quite recently, and the third one is also only about two or three years old. So I'm going to show you guys the insides of a drive, show you guys um, what a hard drive actually is, and um, well, let's get into it. All right. So yeah, we've got a bit of a close-up of the spindle, um, where you guys should be able to see um, the actual hard drive. Uh, I'm just going to slide around over here, just to explain some of it. This is your head assembly over here, which carries your heads on the end of it, which enables it to move up and down on the disc. Uh, that's the actual disc, of which there are multiple discs inside the device, with heads in between there, to read them all. Now, if you are to look very closely at where the head is sitting right now, which is here, you'll see there's like a mark on the disc. Now that mark goes all the way around the disc, which tells me that this head has collided with the disc or collapsed onto the disc at this point. What we can do is we can bring this out from the park position and maybe you can see it a bit clearer there now where we've got that scratch mark on the disc. Um, so yeah, that would be probably what's creating the large whining noise when we try to start this disc up. What I'm actually going to do now is power up the disc and see if we can get it to reproduce that noise for us um, on camera so that you guys can have a listen to it and maybe um, recognize it from hard disk failures and the like. Okay, so we've got our hard drive connected. I'm now going to apply power. There we go, she spins up. You can hear the noise she's making from that head that's touching the disc over there. And there it will spin itself down because there's errors. Uh, now I haven't powered it down, I'm just powering down the power supply now. And start the power supply up again. The hard drive should try and cycle again, but you'll see it fail again. Yeah, because of these, you see over here the head flows quite smoothly, but as soon as it goes in over there, it's making a noise. So if we were to Power up with the head in this area where it hasn't hit. It's a lot quieter than when it's there. See? See an impact on the disc over there which has caused uh, irreparable, irreparable damage to the disc. Um, so the hard drive tries to start up, fails, and then shuts it down again. So, now. I've been doing a bit of research as to what causes this sort of problem, and I think it is can be related to age. Um, I mean, if I look at the, the plate on this hard drive over here, uh, you can't really see it there, but the date of manufacture is the August 2011. It is now nearly August 2015. Uh, well, it's actually nearly July, but... Uh, it just goes to show that um, these hard drives do last for quite some time. I mean, 2011 to 2015, that's a four-year lifespan used in a server NAS device in a corporate environment. I'd say that's pretty good go. So, um, as far as repairing these sort of things, don't bother. It's cheaper and easier just to go and buy a new hard disk. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to show you guys the inner workings of a hard drive so you could see exactly how these things work, uh, how the heads and stuff like that, and what to look for. Um, I must admit this little black section over here protecting the disc is quite new. 
uh, all previous hard drives that I've been inside don't have that, but I suppose due to how close things are with these, that's probably why this is in place. Um, now, I've done some inspections further down in the hard drive, everything else is still intact over here. Uh, the PC board still looks pretty good. Uh, so the only thing it can be is an actual hard disk failure on the hard disk platters themselves. Right there where the head has dug into the disk and caused like a groove line. Pity about that, uh, these one terabyte hard drives aren't too cheap nowadays in South Africa, but uh, hey, what can we do? Guys, that concludes a basic look inside a 3.5 inch PC hard drive. Um, for those of you that have never looked inside one, now you get to see. So after some careful disassembly, we've got the discs out, and uh, I think we've ascertained most of the problem. Now if you look at these discs, they all have that same sort of grind in where the discs park. Um, this one has some dented areas that extend beyond that grind mark. And then the second platter, this one over here, seems to just be on the grind mark. But on this side over here, we have extensive pitting on the disc over here which I believe is the cause for this disc's catastrophic failure on the NAS array. So yeah, guys, I think that uh, pretty much shows us what went down here. Um, pretty much these magnetic discs are what are used for storing the information. In fact, when you put them together like that, they actually somewhat stick together, even though the magnetic field isn't very strong. They do sort of tend to try and stick together. Um, Inside these drives, as well, you've got the control logic board. Um, yeah, we have a looks like a Winbond uh, chip, which uh, is probably got some data on it. Then we've got a smooth chip over here, and over here we have what I assume to be the main control chip with the Seagate branding, um, and then various regulators, diodes, etc., around the board. The electronics on these is pretty straightforward and simple nowadays compared to how they used to be. Uh, there's not a lot to these boards. Uh, they interface with the device through these little contacts over here, um, which interfaces to that piece over there, over here, at the bottom of the hard drive assembly. That's pretty much it, guys. That covers the disassembly and uh, diagnosis of the Seagate 1 terabyte. Thanks for watching. Um, I hope those of you that have never seen hard drives before got to see something a little bit different and new. For those of you that have, um, well, who knows, maybe you get something out of uh, stripping something uh, like I do. Who knows? Take care, guys, and until next time, thanks for watching. Hello, YouTube. Welcome back to the Avion blog. Today I thought I'm going to do a bit of a review for those of you that are um, sort of like playing with the Arduinos. I'm sure we all know the Arduino. This is the Arduino Uno R3. Um, we all are familiar with these. Okay, I think this is a original, but I could stand to be corrected. It could also be a Chinese clone. I'm not too sure. Um, this is the, the standard uh, Arduino Uno, but today, um, I'm sure there's been a lot of reviews on the Unos in the past, we're going to have a look at something a little different. This little guy over here. This is a chip kit by Digilent. It is a chip kit Uno32. Um, it's billed as a replacement for the Uno, um, but designed with a PIC microcontroller instead. Um, it is Uno code compatible. Um, just on the box here, it's a PIC32 MX320F128H processor, 128K flash, 16K RAM, 80 MHz operating speed, um, as we all know, 18, 20 MHz on the Arduino uh, Uno, this guy at 80 MHz, that's a, a huge improvement in operating speed, 42 available IOs, it's compatible with the Arduino system, uh, USB or externally powered and two user LEDs. 
Um, yeah, that's actually quite interesting. It comes in quite a nice little box. Um, but let's actually show you guys what this fella looks like over here. And there we have it. That is the Chipkit Uno 32. I am going to set you guys up so you can get a closer look at this board um, on the bench as we do some testing. Um, but what I am going to do before we get into that is I'm going to quickly solder a clock crystal onto this uh, because I believe it can take one and it doesn't come with one soldered on. So I'm going to get onto that and then I'm going to get you guys nice and close and we'll do a little bit of a review on this guy. Let's see what he's all about. Alright guys, over here we've got the Uno 32 um, alongside the Arduino Uno R3 uh, for size comparison. They are pretty much the same size. Uh, just a few things that I do note about the Uno 32, you can see I have soldered on the little clock crystal over here, which um, allows this thing to use its internal real-time clock. Um, the chip itself is not interchangeable, unlike the older Arduinos, which are the newer ones also are not interchangeable. Um, it is using a lot more surface mount device technology. Um, there are a lot more input output lines on this. Uh, everything else seems to be more or less the same. Um, we've got the bypass or regulator voltage control. We've got our reset. We've got a jumper here. I'm not too sure what that's actually for yet. Then we've got master and slave jumpers. Um, again, not too sure what those are for. And then some more jumpers over here. But we'll have a look at that in the manual. As far as the analog lines, we've got A1 to uh, A0 to A11, so that's 12 analog inputs. Um, you've got your standard sort of voltages over here, and then we've got the IO lines over here. Um, so, yeah, the device itself is far more capable uh, with a lot more sort of technology built into it, which is quite interesting. Um, but now let's get in closer and review the Uno 32, some of the drawbacks of it, um, the things that I like about it, etc. Okay, so yeah, we're looking at the Uno 32, apart from what you might have already heard, um, the additional input outputs, uh, analog lines, real-time clock, the 80 megahertz clock speed. For purposes, it is still an Arduino of sorts. Um, I quite enjoy using this. Uh, one drawback that I have found is if you're used to working with 5 volt stuff, this will not do the job because this guy does operate at 3.3 volts uh, logic level. So if you want to work with 5 volt devices, you're going to have to get uh, uh, I.O. Um, I can't think of the term for it now, but it's basically a converter between 3.3 and 5 volt logic. Um, but besides that, very nice device. I have managed to couple it to a 5 volt screen. The 3.3 volts outputs from this is enough to drive the 5 volt LCD display. You've just got to be careful not to get 5 volts back in here. Um, so basically they run off a common ground but separate power supplies. Um, a few other things to note. It is using very standard technology except for the PIC microchip um, as opposed to the AVR microchip. Um, I have done a few uploads of software to this thing, but I'm going to show you guys that now. And uh, it functions exactly the same as the Arduino. Some of the libraries don't seem to work, but there are libraries growing out there for these devices. So let's uh, take a look at the software. Right. So here we're having a look at the, um, the Chipkit Uno 32 MPIDE software. Um, alongside the Arduino software. Now I'm running the older version over here. I actually have uh, both versions running on my machine uh, because the new one seems to have an issue with Windows 8.1's uh, Java environment, which my well, Windows 8.1 Java is 100%. But anyway, um, now if we, if we have a look, I've opened the Blink program. The Arduino Blink program we all know. We assign pin 13 as LED. Um, pin mode, LED is output. So we're telling it that pin 13 is an output pin. Uh, digital route LED high, which means we're telling LED in turn pin 13 to go high, turn on, output 5 volts, delay 1000 milliseconds, right low, turning it back off to 0 volts to ground, and then delay 1 second, and then it will repeat because this is a loop. Now if we have a look at the MPIDE software, which is for the UNO32, we have a very similar setup, excepting obviously the UNO32 has a predefined um, I'm talking now about the LED on the board. Um, the 
Uno, traditional Uno. Pin 13 is connected to the LED which is on the board. Um, whereas the Uno 32 seems to have it pre-programmed that LED 1 is a specific LED on the board and LED 2 is the other. So we just go with a setup. Pin mode, pin, LED as output. So that LED is now an output. It's not assigned to a specific pin number or whatever the case may be. And then pretty much the coding the same. Pin LED 1 high, delay 1000 milliseconds, which is a second. Uh, pin LED 1 low, and so on and so forth. So as you can see, the coding is pretty much the same. As for the uploading, it is pretty much the same as well. It will upload the code now to the Uno 32, which is connected to the computer on COM8 on USB. Um, and once it's written, uh, it should be the same. Now, if you have a look at these two pieces of software, you would actually swear that the MPIDE is an exact clone of the Arduino or vice versa because they both work very similarly. They look very similar. Everything pretty much looks the same uh, to me. Uh, in fact, as soon as it's finished with the upload, we will go through some of the menus and actually do a quick comparison on the software. Starting now with the Arduino software. You've got your traditional stuff, your sketchbook which is the current sketches that I've been working on your examples um, pretty much all these examples that you see here if we go along over here you've got your sketchbook now I haven't done anything really in here but you've got the same sort of examples under the basic functionality as the Arduino software which is this top section over here the rest of this is all stuff that I've added in with libraries and stuff as I've gone um, upload using programmer, upload to IO board, everything pretty much the same. Your edit will be the same. Your sketch verify, add for import, sketch pretty much the same. Tools, you can select your boards. The difference here being is if you go to the tools on my programmer, you select your boards, you've got your standard. This is the OptiBoot edition of the Arduino software. You've got your standard sort of boards. Um, now I use a USB ASP from time to time, but um, besides that, if you go along here to boards, you'll see we've got Faberino or Fuberino, Olimex, CUI32, Microelectronica boards, chip kit boards like the Uno32, uh, UBW32, then you've got your standard Arduino. So this environment can actually program the standard Arduino stuff as well, as well as the PIC stuff, which is quite nice. Um, yeah, if you look at the software, everything looks pretty much the same. Um, there is not much of a change at all in, in the software packages. Now, if we had a look at... Let's go and have a look at something like um, the analog function. Uh, analog input. Right, now we've opened the analog input input over here, and we've opened the analog input on the MPIDE software as well. So pretty much want to have do a quick comparison to see if there's any major differences in the coding. Let's just go down to the actual code. Now if we look here, we're doing the same thing, A0, LED pin 13, sensor value 0. If you look at it like for like, there is no difference in the code. The coding is exactly the same. Um, so what that basically means is this uh, Uno 32 can be used as a replacement for the Arduino, despite the voltage difference. But I mean, if you use 3.3 .3 volt Arduinos, then this will be exactly the same, just with a lot more functionality. So yeah, I think that pretty much covers it from the software aspect of thing. Right. I just thought I'd give it another bash um, to see if it is Linux compatible because I know a lot of users also use the Linux OS. So I've gone across to my Linux computer and um, everything seems to be functioning pretty much the same over here. Uh, you've got your, your standard sort of um, samples. Uh, I don't often use the, uh, the Linux for programming, although it is my bench computer, but, but pretty much everything is the same no matter what uh, operating system you use, but I just wanted to check if the MPIDE does run okay on Linux, and it does uh, using the Java environment, so yeah, I'm quite happy with that. Um, so yeah, as far as um, 
capabilities for OS is concerned, I think it works pretty well. So, just in concluding, uh, let's have a look at the uh, Uno uh, Chip Kit 32, uh, Uno 32, and uh, have a look at it here close up in this photograph. What can be seen on the top left, if you've got your reset button, below that your USB. Then you've got your, your header pins uh, for your input output lines as well as your analog on the bottom with your voltages. I do notice it does use the standard FTDR chip uh, for interconnectivity. Uh, pick microcontroller and there's batches of jumpers which we will cover at a later stage. Um, I'm not too sure what all the jumpers are for except for the bottom one which is the power select. Um, these boards are pretty well made, uh, pretty well put together and with the, the red um, PC board uh, coating or masking whatever you want to call it uh, seems to be quite nice and different from the traditional blues and greens um, yeah I quite like the board uh, these four LEDs on the board uh, two near the top left which are your transmit receive LEDs for uploading then you've got another two LEDs on the top right side of the board just below the input output header which is uh, your prog programmable LEDs um, the device is pretty reliable. I've had this uh, this one using it for about a year now with no issues. I haven't seen much information on them, but I do hope that these guys do make a uh, a bit more of an appearance because they are lovely devices to work with. Anyway, guys, that's it for this brief review at the uh, Chipkit Uno 32. I hope you guys enjoyed it, and uh, take care until next time.